Good morning. You know, the older I get, the more important my pillow has become. If I don't have my pillow, my neck sometimes uh, feels kind of funny. If I don't have the right pillow, I can wake up, you know, with, with, with a crick in my neck. So my, my neck does not like the pillow to be too thick. My neck does not like the, the pillow to be uh, too soft. Uh, my neck does not like the, the pillow to be uh, certainly too hard. I want that pillow to be just right. This morning in our, our lesson from Scripture, we're going to find uh, Jacob, who certainly does not have a problem with sleeping on a hard pillow. We're going to find his story in Genesis chapter 28. We're going to look at the first uh, several verses there in, in uh, Genesis 28. And we're going to find Jacob sleeping on a hard pillow. Before we take a look at the text, though, let me remind you, we're in a series right now on Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We started out with Abraham, the friend of God. So we kind of took a close look at his life to see what it means to be a friend of God. And then we, we transitioned into Isaac, and we took a closer look at his life. And now we're taking a look at Jacob at his life. And the reason we're looking at these three characters is that God identifies himself with these three guys. At the burning bush, you know, he tells Moses he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So these are three very important characters. We can learn a lot of lessons from their lives. And today we're kind of going deeper into the life of Jacob. So let's take a look at his, his story as it, as it continues to unfold in Genesis chapter 28. Starting in, um, we'll start there in verse, I said... Uh, one through nine, so let's see. All right, let's, let's pick up. Uh, I wanted to pick up with his dream, Jacob's uh, dream at Bethel. So let's look at uh, 28, starting in verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran, where he reached a certain place. He stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord. He said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I, I, I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Okay, so we see that the, the pillow becomes a pillar. This, this stone that he lays his head on, which is amazing to me, I'm thinking, golly, how could you sleep on a rock like that? But, but he did, he slept on that rock and he went sound asleep. And then later on, he, he takes that very same rock and he makes a pillar out of it and dedicates it to God. So, so all this comes to him in the context of a dream. He's asleep and in the dream, he sees this vision and this vision leads him to make a vow. I really like the way a commentator Warren Wiersbe breaks this down. Uh, he mentions that it, it begins with a, a day of disappointment which turns to a night of discovery and ends with a morning of dedication. So let's, let's kind of break this story down in that, in that very same way. The day of disappointment. That's the way this day begins before he has the dream. 
And you say, well, why was it a day of disappointment? Well, it's because at this time, Jacob is on the run. He's basically a fugitive. He is trying to get out of the country. He's on his way out of the promised land. Why? Because his brother Esau is plotting to kill him. And so why is his brother Esau plotting to kill him? Well, you remember the story of Jacob and Esau and how Jacob stole Esau's birthright? Remember, dad was uh, basically about to leave this world. He's getting on up in years. He, he couldn't see good, and he thought he was about to die, so he, he wanted to bless his son Esau before he left the world. He says, go out and kill me some wild game. He liked to eat wild game, loved the savoriness of the dish, and so he sent him out to get that. Meantime, Mama overhears it, and she goes to her favorite son, Jacob, and says, I want you to go in and pretend like you're Esau, and you get the blessing instead. So that's what happens. He makes sure he has on Esau's clothes so he'll smell right. Make sure he has fur on his neck and on his hands so he'll feel right. Make sure he has the, the dish fixed up just right so it'll taste right. And so he goes in and deceives his dad, Isaac, and he ends up stealing the birthright. Well, you can imagine how Esau feels about that. Now he's not going to become the patriarch of the family. Now he's not going to get the double measure of inheritance. Now he's not going to be the channel through which the entire world is blessed. His descendants aren't going to get the promised land. Jacob has slipped in there and stole the birthright. Not so why couldn't he just take it back? Well, in that day and time when the word went out, it was seen as binding. It was like a legal written document today. It couldn't be revoked. It couldn't be taken back. So he slipped in there and stole the blessing. Well, how does Esau respond? He responds with uh, bitter tears. And then after the tears go away, then the anger sets in and he is furious. And he plans to kill his brother Jacob. So he's really upset about this. Well, once again, Mama gets word. Rebecca, she hears he's going to try to, try to kill Jacob. And she does not want that to happen. So she goes to him and says, look, you need to leave the country. I want you to go back to my relatives in Haran. Go back and, and stay with them for a while. And then when Esau cools down, I'll send word for you and you can come back. Well, then she goes, and this Rebecca, she's kind of a, a conniver in a way. Then she goes to Isaac and she says, you know, I'm going to paraphrase. I can't stand my in-laws. My daughter's in-laws, I can't stand them. And, and they, her, her in-laws were Esau's wives that he had married there in the community. Some of the local girls. You say, well, what was wrong with the local girls there? Well, they were ungodly. They were Hittite slash Canaanite. Uh, their values were not God's values. They were idol worshipers and all the immorality they went with that and they were kind of all associated with that and she did not want she didn't want Jacob to marry one of those girls so she, she says, says to Isaac she says my life basically is not worth living if, if Jacob does what Esau does if he marries one of these local girls I just don't want to live so you know it's one of those things if mama ain't happy nobody's happy so, so Isaac summons Jacob in and he tells Jacob he said uh, I want you to leave the country and go back to your uh, mother's relatives and find a wife for yourself so he he agrees and on top of that he blesses him again and so he leaves and he sets out to leave the country for two reasons one to find a wife and the overriding reason was to spare his life his mother sort of was behind this plan to get him out of there and now daddy is behind it too and so they've sent him away to leave the country to get the wife but again the overriding reason he's leaving is to save his own life because Esau is mad enough to kill him he, he plans that when his dad passes away he's going to get even and he's going to take care of him so that's, that's why this is considered a, a day of disappointment he, he's leaving the country, he's leaving his mother, he's leaving his dad, he's leaving the, the, the comforts of home. I'm sure he felt anything but blessed. Yes, he has stolen the birthright, he has stolen the blessing, but now he's finding himself on the run. So I am sure he doesn't feel blessed at that particular moment. So that is the day of disappointment which leads to the, the, the night of discovery. On his way out of the land when it gets dark, he didn't want to travel in the night, so he decides to make camp. And it's outside this town called uh, Luz. Most likely the, the gates are shut. He can't get in. So he's outside the city there. And he takes this, this stone and he uses it as a pillow. And he, he goes to sleep. And, and again, apparently, I was thinking, man, he must be a tough guy. What do y'all think? 
You know, he's, he's, he's not as wimpy as me, so he, he's able to sleep there with that stone under his head. And in, in the night, he has a dream. And did you notice the NIV translation said he, he sees a stairway to heaven? I think some of the older translations mention a ladder. We've heard of Jacob's ladder. Well, there's some debate over was it a ladder or a stairway? Well, I'm, I lean toward the stairway myself, and maybe I'm uh, prejudiced against ladders uh, because I really don't like to get up high on ladders. Do y'all? I fell off a ladder when we were uh, building this church, and lucky I didn't break my back. So, I, so I have a hard time. Maybe so I'm biased, maybe against ladders. I, I have a hard time uh, envisioning angels going up and down a ladder. I mean, it's kind of a cool idea, but it kind of makes more sense to me if it's stairway. And by the way, that word seems there's some other words that's similar to Hebrew that it does mean a stairway, and that, some scholars lean that way. There's, there's not really this, this word for stairway in the Bible anywhere. I mean, a ladder. So, so anyway, I'm going to go with stairway. Is that okay with y'all? Okay, good. So he sees this stairway, and on the stairway he sees all these angels. There's angels, you know, coming down the stairs and angels going back up the stairs. You know, they're ascending and ascending. And I can't help but wonder if some are coming down and some others are going up. And there's just all these angels just going back and forth from the earth all the way back up to heaven. Don't you know that was a cool sight? He's sitting there, no telling how long he's just taking all this in. All these angels coming down, and all these angels going up. So our question is, what, what does that mean? What, what is the, the point of that? Well, obviously God is trying to communicate something to Jacob, and indirectly, something to us as well. I believe what we see here is that God is wanting Jacob to understand that angels are going to be at work in the affairs of his life. They're going to be, quote unquote, behind the scenes. They're going to be there helping orchestrate the plans of Almighty God. These angels are, are mediators between heaven and earth. There's something that God wanted Jacob to understand. That there is a spiritual realm. There are things going on. He wasn't aware of it. He, he brings that up in, 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 the, in the text here. But in this dream, and through this dream, God gives him the vision. And, and these angels are to remind him that God is in control. And that he is going to be working through these angels. Now this is not really any different than what we find in the New Testament. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14. In the New Testament we're told that, that angels are ministering spirits sent to serve those who inherit salvation. So if you are a Christian this morning, if you are saved according to God's word, there, there are angels out there, if you will, that are ministering and serving you. Isn't that a sobering thought? You may not see them. You're probably not aware that they're even there. But God has a plan for your life which is in agreement with his overall plan. And through the agency of angels, he works out that plan and works in your life through those angels. And they work in all kinds of ways. You know, I think of the book of Daniel where the angels, you know, da Daniel's praying and some angels come in in response to his prayer, but it got held up three weeks because it was wrestling with a demon angel. Well, there's, there's no doubt all kinds of things going on in the spiritual realm that we can't see, but it seems that our prayers uh, have something to do with what the angels do. In the New Testament, remember, they're, they're praying for Peter who's, who's in jail, and they're praying for him, and what happens? An angel shows up in the cell and, and, and basically breaks him out of jail. And I've heard it said, yeah, there was an angel that, that, that got Peter out, but it was the prayers of the saints that fetched the angel that got Peter out. And so that lets us know that when we pray, we have the potential to set angels in motion that work in our behalf. Isn't that a neat idea? We just can't imagine what all is going on in the spiritual realm. Right now, at this very moment, Scripture seems to even indicate that angels watch over the worship service. There's no doubt angels here this morning watching what's going on. They help us in all kinds of ways. Again, through our prayers, they protect us. They watch over us. They serve us. They minister to us. It's kind of hard for me to get my mind around the idea that an angel actually might serve me sometimes because I don't really look at it that way. But that's what the Word of God says. 
So there's angels involved in your life right now and helping with God's plan in your life right now. You can't see them just like Jacob couldn't see them until God opened his eyes. You know, I believe God wanted him to understand that these, these angels were on a mission in his life to help him become the person that he needed to be. Ultimately to help him stay true to this promise that God was giving him and ultimately to help bless other people. Now at the top of the stairs, so we got the angels going up and down the stairs. At the top of the stairs stood the Lord. Hmm. Wow. I wish we had more description of what that was like. But God stands at the top of those stairs and he, he um, identifies himself in kind of an unusual way. It's, it's, it is subtle, but, but notice uh, God identifies himself as the God of, talking to Jacob, as the God of his father Abraham and the God of Isaac. Now you would expect God to say, your father Isaac, since Isaac was Jacob's father. But he doesn't. He says he's the God of Jacob's father Isaac. Abraham. Well, Abraham wasn't his literal father. Isaac was his father. So is God trying to communicate something even with this way of identifying himself? Now, it's true Abraham was his grandpa, and in that sense he was his, his father, but I think there's more to it than that. He's identifying Abraham as his father because Abraham was the father, you might say, of the faith. He is the father of, of, of this, this promise that God has given now, we've seen this, this promise being reiterated over and over and over in this series. You know, God is saying, I'm, I'm going to bless you, Abraham, even though you're an old guy. You're, you're basically a senior citizen. I'm still going to uh, make you the father of nations. You're, you're going to have, you know, you're going to have descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the, and the uh, grains of sand on the seashore. In other words, there's going to be so many, it's going to be, can't even count them all. But most importantly, the entire earth is going to be blessed through you. And I think what God is saying is he's saying, now, Jacob... That same promise, Abraham's kind of the father of that promise. Now that's being transferred to you. Yeah, you, you got blessed through your daddy, but I'm much more important than your daddy. This is God here, and I'm reiterating the promise, and I'm letting you know that I'm with you and that you are the one that's going to carry on this, 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 uh, this uh, promise that was first given to Abraham. You're going to be the one. You're going to be this channel of blessing, which ultimately is going to be a blessing for the entire world. Now, for us on this side of history, ultimately, Jesus is that blessing. Jesus comes through this line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But God is saying to him, he's letting him know, I'm endorsing you. I'm standing behind this promise. You saw the angels. You see me at the top of the stairs. You hear my voice. I'm the one telling you that I'm going to be with you. So this must have been reassuring to Jacob. Again, he's on the run. I'm sure he doesn't feel very blessed. His life seems to be becoming unraveled. He's having to leave his family. He's having to go back to somewhere he's never even been before. Everything seems to be coming undone, so God is stepping in. He said, uh-uh, don't give up. There's a promise, and you're a part of that promise, and I'm working through you. I've got a plan, and you're part of it. I think God could say the same thing to all of us. He has a plan for us all. If you belong to Christ, rest assured, God is working in your life and through your life, not only for you, but ultimately for his overall plan. Well, in the vision, I think God was challenging Jacob to believe the incredible. I didn't realize this at first, but on further study, we find that at this time, Jacob is 77 years old. I bet y'all didn't see him as being that old, did you? 77. He's not married. He doesn't have any children. And once again, we see God promising him he's going to have descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the, you know, basically like the dust of the earth. They're going to be everywhere. And yet he's 77. God is asking him to believe what seems incredible. God was going to give him Canaan, and though at the moment he's a fugitive fleeing the land, ultimately, ultimately, 
He is going to receive the promised land, and then his descendants will come after that. To these covenant promises, I like the way God gets personal with Jacob. Notice he says he's going to be with Jacob. That's presence. He's going to watch over Jacob. That's protection. He's going to bring him back to the land. That's the promise. And then God even says, I'm not going to forsake you. In other words, I'm not going to turn my back on you. I am going to bring you back to this place. I'm going to personally provide for you, and I'm going to protect you. All these promises must have been of extreme comfort to Jacob at this difficult time in his life. And as I thought about these, these promises that God was giving him, I, I couldn't help but think of how we have those very same promises today in Christ. For example, do we not have God's presence with us as Christians? You know, God's promising to be with, with Jacob. His presence is going to be there. He's going to protect him. Do we not have the same promise today? We have the presence of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. Jesus says, when two or more are gathered together, I'm there with him. He's here right now. We have God's presence with us. Do we not still have God's protection? I love this verse in Psalm 34, verse 7. It says, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. God's our protector. He protects us. No doubt the angels, again, are involved. And of course, we have the promise that God is going to bring us into the promised land. As we've seen over and over in this series, the promised land is a foreshadowing of the promised land of heaven itself. If you are a Christian this morning, you are a part of this Abrahamic promise. Ultimately, we are headed to the promised land. Do you believe that? I don't know about you, but I love being a part of this promise that God originally gave to Abraham. And it's neat to look back and see how God has worked it out all through history. And then, of course, Hebrews 13, 5 says, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. That's for us. God's promised to, to be with us. He's not going to turn his back on us. He's with us till we get to the promised land. So Jacob certainly had a night of discovery. You know, he got a glimpse of the kind of God that he serves. Next comes this morning of dedication. When he woke up the next morning, here's where the pillow becomes a pillar. I used to have somebody in my family that called a pillow a pillar. You ever had anybody say that to you? Called it a pillow a pillar? Well, here the pillar becomes the pillar. Takes the, 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 the stone and he, he stands the stone up and then he takes some oil, some olive oil, and he anoints the stone with it, puts it, and so it, he's, he's dedicating the stone. He's dedicating that as a, as a, as a place of worship. He, he names the place Bethel, which means a house of God, because he realized he had been in the presence of God. He didn't realize it, but then the dream revealed it to him in the vision, so he wants to set this place uh, as, as, a, as a special place, dedicates it. He also refers to it as the gate of heaven. It's the place where he, he, could, he could meet God. So it was a very important place. So dedicating this stone carries some symbolism with it. He's uh, not only dedicating the stone, but ultimately he's dedicating himself. He's dedicating himself to the worship of God. And by the way, this is the first recorded vow in the Bible. For those of you who are into trivia... Uh, there are two ways to interpret this vow. Some people, and perhaps a majority of scholars, think Jacob is bargaining with God. Now that's certainly consistent with his character. In other words, he's saying, God, if you'll do this, I'll do that. You ever done that with God? Let's make a deal. I don't think you should do that, by the way. Because when you surrender your life to Christ... He becomes the boss. The deal making's over with. But anyway, some people do that. Some believe that he's saying, God, if you'll provide for me and if you'll protect me and watch over me and do all these wonderful things to you, then I'll become a tither. In other words, he, he's kind of bribing God. Trying to manipulate God. I hope for his sake he wasn't doing that. But some interpret it that way. The other interpretation is that Jacob is expressing amazement for all that God's done for him. 
And it's like he's saying, God, in light of all the blessings that you've given me, you're saying you're going to provide for me. You're saying you're going to protect me. You're saying you're not going to forsake me. You're saying you're going to bring me back to the promised land. Here's what I'm going to do, Lord. I'm going to worship you at this place, and I'm even going to tithe to you and give you 10%. Now, obviously, me as a preacher, I lean toward that, that second view because I like it better, but I do realize there's a possibility that he is trying to make a deal with God and bargain with God. But I hope I'm, I'm making sense of, of, of this other interpretation uh, that, that he is just in this sense of amazement. And as a result of what God's going to do for him, he's saying, if God, uh, this, let's look again at verse 20, at the vow. He said, if God will, will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking and will give me the food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. So you can see he's either making a bargain, which it does sound like, but in the context of what all God's already said he's going to do for him, he could just be expressing what God's going to do for him, and he's, he's willing to become a follower of God. Either way, though, from this point on, he is a part of this, this, this promise of God, and he's going to continue to work out this promise of God, and we're going to see God working in his life all the way to the point of bringing him back to the promised land. So Jacob's response to the, to the vision, I'm going to say, uh, should be our response as well. First of all, when you really catch the glimpse of God, you should respond in faith, fearing him. So we find him being fearful once he realized he'd seen God at the top of the stairs. Now I know in our day and time we don't like this idea of fear. We, we, we say God is love and we shouldn't fear him and all that and, and he is a God of love, by the way. But the Apostle Paul does tell us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. <laughs> so that the trembling is what it means. It means there, there should be an element of fear. Now, now granted, it's reverence, it's, it's respect, but there should be a healthy fear of God. And we see that in Jacob. You know, he's got this fearfulness. You know, he's, he's, he's coming face to face. He's seeing God at the top of the stairs. So now he's, he's preparing to worship God. And I think anytime we worship God, there should be this element of reverence and respect and, yes, even fear as we come into the presence of God and worship him. We should never come here and worship God and uh, be flippant and, and horse around and not take it serious. This is a very serious time when we, we come together. It's, it's not like going to a, to, a, to a ball game or some other sporting event. It's, 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 it's a serious time where we come reverently with respect for God and worship Him. And you know, He dedicated this stone. It became a, a memorial stone. You know, we partook this morning in a, in a memorial. The Lord's Supper is a memorial. We do this in remembrance of, of Christ Jesus, as Chad was, was telling us this morning. You know, it, it is a memorial. So in that sense, you know, we come and recognize what God has done. We recognize His appearing to us in the body of Jesus Christ. And of course, if we're really dedicated to God, I think, like Jacob, we follow too with, with the tithe. I, I believe God, I, that's a good, good place to start, by the way. You say, well, John, that's in the Old Testament. Well, yeah, it was before the law. It was before the law. So Abraham, we, he seems to have been someone who understood the importance of the tithe. Tithe to Melchizedek. We see Jacob here. He's tithing. Of course, we see in the law of Moses the tithe. And then in the New Testament, Jesus even compliments the Pharisees, which he didn't do very often. He did compliment them as good tithers. They just fell in the weightier matters of the law of justice and mercy. But I, I do think when we really give our lives to God, I think the tithe should be there. Uh, so, so in a sense, Jacob's story is really our story. Before you come to Christ, it, it, is, it is a day of disappointment. Life can really be disappointing and meaningless without God in it. There's that, that hole in our heart that only Christ can fill. There, there really is a, a, a type of disappointment before we come to God. And then we have our, our, our night of discovery, if you will, when we find Jesus Christ. And he reveals himself to us. And then that should be followed by, by the, the morning of dedication, if you will. Where we dedicate our lives to him. And like Jacob, like Jacob, we're not yet enjoying the promised land. But that day is coming. And in the meantime, 
We have the Lord's presence to go with us and protect us. Jesus says in Matthew 28, 20, and I'll close with this. He says, surely, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we uh, thank you for your word and the, and the valuable lessons that we can learn from it. Like Jacob, we're, we're not perfect, Lord. We make mistakes. Sometimes we try to take matters into our own hands. We don't always uh, wait upon you to work in our lives like, like we should. But in spite of that, Lord, you're patient with us. Patient with us, wanting us to rely upon you, trust in your timing, and ultimately follow you into the promised land of heaven itself. And I pray, God, that there's anybody here this morning who, who needs to make a decision. Maybe they're in that, 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 that day of disappointment. But they need, they need you, God. And I, I just pray that Right now, if there's someone who needs to leave that, that time of disappointment into that time of discovery and dedication, Lord, I pray that right now they'd make a decision for you because your word says today is the day of salvation. We never know, Lord, how much time we have. And I pray right now, God, that your spirit would move in this building. If there's anybody here who needs to make a decision for you, maybe a rededication decision. Maybe renew the vow of following you. May they come now, Lord, as we sing this song. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's all stand.
message from John this morning. Let's sing one more song before we dismiss. Sing it loud. That's the name of the song.
the victory is won. We will.